Leadership Award project. A million pounds for this project, investing the unexplored side of multilingualism. And I have to confess that I feel like the total interloper here because A, I don't work on Asia or in Asia. B, uh, I don't work on written text at all, but uh, exclusively on speech in this project at least. And Three, uh, we do not have uh, data in one language, but we look at multilingualism in three uh, village communities uh, in this area, in southern <coughs> Senegal, so here you have with the Atlantic uh, coast of West Africa, Gambia here, nice beaches, and we're here. And here, with the red dotted line, you see our main field area. Three villages, and um, my personal field site is there. And this is what we have been doing for almost four years now. We are in our fifth year. So we work in these three village communities that we call the crossroads. And uh, we look at the languages that are nominally associated with these villages, but also at how people actually uh, speak. And they use an astonishing amount of languages. So we have three senior uh, researchers here, and then myself, a little bit outside and another uh, researcher in Senegal on control languages. And then we have uh, six PhD students, we used to, one dropped out. They also look at the same area, in the same area they look at language use in social networks and, and women, children, code mixing, dikes and other topics that I will not tell you anything about um, today. But rather, I'm going to morph myself into our workflow manager, Rachel Watson, who put together the bulk of what I'm going to tell you today, um, namely how our data management works. And so you may already have gained the impression that this is a, a project that involves many people. <laughs> and um, so we have the researchers here. And some of them are based in London, some of them are based in Senegal, um, some are actually in the field, some are 450 kilometers away, so that brings with it communication problems. Then we have our research participants, so the people whose language use, we observe and record. And then we have a local transcriber team um, that have been, people who have been trained uh, to transcribe our uh, speech data uh, recorded on audio and video. And then some people have more than one function. So you see here some lines because we have two uh, corpus managers. Um, and uh, it speaks for <laughs> Rachel's self effacing uh, modesty that she actually omitted herself and her central role in the project, namely that of workflow manager. And um, she also omitted a very central person in our field base in rural Senegal, our uh, transcription manager. And this is a role she created. And um, in what follows, I'll tell you a little bit about how these roles came to be created and what their functions are and why we need them. Because as you may guess from this slide, it's all going to be a lot about the human factor in data management. So, just a little bit about the type of data uh, we have. So we have linguistic elicitations, you know, the kind of torture where you sit a consultant in front of a mic and ask them paradigms. We have interviews, we have psycholinguistic experiments, we have so-called staged communicative events. Uh, we do ethnographic and social linguistic participant observation and we have recorded field notes or our brains. We have data where we leave the camera in a household, for instance, for an afternoon and just record all the interactions and then later come and collect the camera and you know, take whatever is on the card. We have our Lavalier mic data, which we fondly like to call KGB data, um, where we uh, observe the, uh, interaction, <laughs> the linguistic interactions of six focal agents, two per village. So they get a clip-on mic that records the entire interactions when they choose to keep the mic switched on for an entire day. And for each of these six focal agents, we have uh, collected two days worth of language use. And we have photos. We're doing really badly with photos, so I will not talk 
about photos at all. And yeah, questionnaire, social linguistic interviews. So a very complex, diverse set of data collected by many different people. And here I'm only going to talk about what our corpus data are. So, so far, this is the state of, as of February this year, roughly 100 hours of transcribed and translated speech data, all tagged for participants and language as identified by our transcribers. You can ask me about that uh, in the question time. Um, so far, we have identified 211 participants and our transcribers have identified 20 languages spoken by people living in these three villages. Um, so, just to give you an idea how it looks like, um, so this is the uh, percentage of languages that are spoken in our corpus so far. So you see these, are, these three portions of the languages nominally associated with these three villages. Then you have Wolof, which is the major national lingua franca of Senegal, here and uh, oops and then you have french which is the official language of senegal here and then you get all kinds of other languages um here you can only see 13 the others are you know <laughs> they don't come out because they're a fraction of the small. <coughs> if you look at it per village so it's <coughs> Dibon Kerr, and the language that is associated with Dibon Kerr is here and you see all kinds of other things this is only uh lavalier mic data okay so da interactional data uh, all kinds of other languages being used all the time. Next village next door looks really different. This is the patrimonial language. It's by far not the most widely spoken language in interaction. And then in the other one, we uh, get the inverse uh, distribution, actually. This is the patrimonial language associated with that village, and it's the one that is used in the majority of contexts. And then the others come in only in a minority. So what do we do with these data? Um, yesterday, you kind of had the uh, end uh, result of the process of what we are doing with our data when Mandana Zephidinipo gave a talk on data management in the Endangered Languages Archive. So we use the tools that are also used by the Endangered Languages Archive. So here you see Arbol, which is a corpus management tool. And... Uh, we create for every single uh, recording, we create a session, which is a resource bundle that consists of the media file, all annotations, translations, and uh, metadata, crucially. And so here you can see some here we have our, our session here. I you can do this here. So this is, being, this is the name of the session, and all associated files will have an identical name. Um, and we have very strict conventions for file naming that I can explain to you uh, in detail later if you're interested. And then we have uh, actors that are defined. Um, so you can just drag and drop them to your session if you know them already. If not, it's a, again a regulated process to add actors. And we type for languages and for all kinds of other things. But this is how ideally all media files should be managed in our local corpus and then uploaded to an online archive. And this is how uh, the data we mainly work with, the corpus data look like um, in terms of um, what information we have and what we work with. So this is uh, a screenshot of a software called Elan, which is a multimedia annotation tool that our transcribers use to transcribe and translate, and then um, identify participants and tag for languages. Yeah, so you have the original transcription, the translation into French. Orthography is our transcribers. We don't interfere with that at all at this level. Um, and here you see you. So in this small stretch, you already have one, two, three languages. Okay. So, and then um, we have an intermediary step before we can actually have all our files uh, in our online corpus. We also have a kind of working corpus on two different networked drives that are regularly um, back up. And here you can see our file structure there, that's the intermediary one. 
where we everybody knows uh, also where to find uh, things. Um, and this is how it would look in the archive. So far, so good. And so easy, right? Because it's dead easy. We all know data management is straightforward. You collect the data, you create the metadata and annotations, you deposit it in the corpus, you analyze it, the end. Well, in our case, uh, very often, uh, we don't know the people we record because we record spontaneous interactions. We don't just sit people who we know in front of a mic. So very often it's impossible for us to identify the participants, especially with the Lavalier mic data, when people walk around in our absence. And very often the transcribers <laughs> don't know all the people. So it's actually quite a time intensive intelligence gathering process sometimes to find out who is speaking and we cannot identify everybody but of course we are going to try very hard because we are trying to understand multilingual language use in interaction language as a social practice so we need to know a lot about the participants very often we don't know the places we cannot identify a fraction of the languages you know and not even our transcribers can transcribe or understand all of them um, for the metadata and annotations, we early on in the uh, project, we really hid a dead end that was terrible because all these tools are designed to work online and we had planned for internet access in our field base and, you know, uh, Senegal Telecom never <laughs> laid the cable that would have allowed us to have internet access. So all our work in uh, Senegal is offline. That creates a considerable time lag between different steps in the workflow. And we all know what happens if you have a lag, you know, things fall through the cracks. And it makes the interfaces less smooth. And finally, you know, we are 12 researchers uh, plus five transcribers. Um, all our collaboration is based on a certain degree of standardization, harmonization, unless that is created, you know, everybody can only work with their own data and we cannot actually create a corpus that is usable for everybody and accessible for people who don't know uh, our particular uh, environment. So these were the challenges we were confronted with and uh, now I'm going to tell you a little bit um, how we confronted them. So this is kind of how it was initially. Um, so we had the researchers and they collected and you know, researchers really like to collect data a lot. And uh, they also like to give them to other people to work with them. So researchers would give files to transcribe to the transcribers in the base and we already had a kind of somebody in an administrative uh, position. But he was not explicitly responsible for managing the transcription uh, pipeline, okay? So people would sidestep him. You know, many of the transcribers are kind of nominally attached to some researchers <coughs> who had worked there previously. And everybody, of course, always wants to have their own data transcribed, right? Because, you know, you always need them next week. And so we had these constant problems. Our transcribers were saying, we need a pay rise, we are working overtime, you know, because people give us these files to transcribe. And we kept saying, but we have a plan, what's going wrong? Um, Similarly, when the files were transcribed, we, it was very difficult to track where in the pipeline a file was because sometimes the transcribers would give it back to our administrator, sometimes they would give them back to the transcribers on a memory stick, on a hard drive, you know, uh, as a WhatsApp attachment when they had a 3G network. Sometimes files vanished, nobody knew which one was the good version. So it was a big mess. And similarly with the corpus, people came back to London and kind of would, of course, always know where their files were. But somehow our beautifully designed plans, you know, at the beginning about creating this overarching architecture never really fell in place. And so, we decided to have a workflow and a workflow master. And from my personal perspective, actually, 
that was maybe the most important um, experience that I had in leading this whole project was that it's really important to find good people to actually fulfill particular roles. And so, you know, this was a little bit self-selective as well. Um, because you need to have a certain mindset, you know, and a great team spirit and, and sense of responsibility to take on such a role. So, so luckily we had Rachel, and she got really interested in principles of workflow design. And um, what she did was really nice because she started looking at the points where we encountered problems and instead of, you know, just sending out these emails, you know, we have a policy, please do this, 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 that make people feel defensive and stop reading these emails, she really started investigating, okay, what, why do certain things not happen at certain times? And then she started reading up on workflow uh, designs, which take this human factor into account, and came up with these principles. So let the data management flow be dictated by the natural cycle of research and field trips, not the other way around. So given that our initial workflow, that is also the one that is always recommended in data and in, in, in language documentation, was too simple and did not you know, do justice to our complex time and yeah, chronotopes, basically, um, you know, we needed one that took account of that. And then where a task must be carried out in a very specific way by multiple team members, we need to have documents detailing the process in explicit detail. But also, if something does not need to spell out in detail, well, then don't be prescriptive. Then let people just do what they want to do. And finally, try to apportion tasks according to knowledge and expertise, but also, you know, some things just need to be done and there's no shying away from it. And that needs to be enforced. And finally, you always need somebody who is looking after these things and oversees the entire process. And so, um, this is then how our whole overall workflow uh, was simplified and strategized. So the researchers, rather than going to individual transcribers, had to go through our transcription master in our field base, who has a master list and who is the only one who can give files to transcribe to transcribers. And it's the only one who gets them back and transfers them to the researchers. Then, he wants, oh yes, not to the researchers, exactly, that's also important. So, you know, this again, this chaos, you know, where are my files? And also files can belong to more than one people, has been eliminated because he only talks to the corpus master in London, who has a spreadsheet. And she logs all the stages and also what is missing and needs to be done. And she then talks to the researcher if something's missing or gives them transcription so that they can work with them and unify session bundles that have something missing, etc. And then she oversees that everything is uploaded into the corpus with all the elements that are required. So this is the spreadsheet she has. So you can see here the names for these sessions, and then this tells you has it doesn't have an, uh, a transcription and an annotation file in Elan, does it have a WAF file, does it have an MP4 file, um, is it transcribed? Um, uh, participants, really important, you see we have 211 participants. How do we recognize them? Well, we have a participant master list where every participant gets a unique code. And again, we have a participant master. So whenever somebody encounters a participant that is not yet known in our other favorites, they have to go to her and she assigns the code, etc. Is the language identified? Um, and MD, is a, that means, is there a metadata file? So. Um, I can actually pass these around. So these are some explicit workflows um, for you to circulate and have a look at. You can also see them on our um, website, which is SOAS Crossroads Org.
Um, Rachel has written a blog post on the workflow and you can download all these there if you want. Here I'm only going to show you some examples for particular, you know, critical points and uh, what is specified there. Note also that these workflows, they do not, they're not technical help files. We have separate technical help files, like if you don't know how to convert um, an uncompressed audio file into an mp3 or an mpeg uh, force, an uncompressed media file into an mp4, we have uh, a file with screenshots and step-by-step -step instructions for that. So we try not to overload these. So every single thing is broken down into as simple as possible steps. So this is kind of the first step when you have a recording that you need to create um, a session bundle for in, in Arbel. And uh, so what happens here is, okay, you, we have a set of minimal uh, metadata that we need to know. So you need to have the name, you need to know where it's been recorded, when, by whom. A lot of that is already present in the name, which is very mnemonic. Um, but you also need to know who is speaking, and ideally you want to have the languages. So, okay, so this can be nicely broken down. Do you know the participants? Yes. Okay, then go to this step. Okay, do they have a code? And then you decide yes or no. Okay, if they don't have a code, so if you, how do you know? You check this document, and it tells you where this document is located as well on our shared drive. But here, this is the crucial step, you know, this is the thing where something is not done at a particular point and if then you don't take care of doing it at a later point when you have the necessary information, it just never happens. So this is, okay, do you know the participant? No. Then the next question for you to consider is why not, first of all, not noted by researcher, well that's your point, you go back and do it, okay? But if it's from the, you know, the uh, Lavalier mic data, where you then you cannot know them, right? Then you wait for the transcription and you do it then. And for that, we then have our corpus uh, master who has the spreadsheet and sees that this information is missing to remind you. Um, another short example um, from the second uh, workflow sheet where you prepare files for transcription, again to give an example. So here it says prepare, prepare files for transcription. Okay, so the first step you do is you convert all your files to WAF and M, uh, MP4 so that the transcribers do not need to work with these huge uncompressed files. And if you don't know that, we have a sheet, you know, to help you, but it's not on here. And then you go on and again it's broken down step by step. Another example, this is, um, so you have a recording, you have created the first metadata, and uh, now you have a transcription, right? So the, the transcribers have transcribed and uh, identified the participant languages in Elan, okay? And so you get this, and you check what happened. So you open the file, you check the participants in the annotation, and you see, are there gaps? There are always gaps. So why? So this, I mean, yeah, this case, that they're all identified, never happens. Uh, so no. Well, email the transcription master and attach the Elon file and request the identification of participants. Note that this is also something we had to hone regarding file transfer because we don't have internet in our area, but what we have, we have a good mobile network, 3G network, so we cannot transfer media files at all or upload them. But the transcription files are very small. You know, they're the size of text files. So we can transfer these in WhatsApp. So that is actually very helpful. So, you know, we can actually send a, a transcription file to our corpus, uh, to our transcription master in our field base. And they can check and they are there, you know, um, they, they can ask even the people who participated in the recording to identify the missing participants. Okay. How much time do I have left? Okay. And um, so this is just uh, to give you an example where, you know, this is a point where, you know, there is, you cannot ask anybody else, you know, this is something that 
When you get to this point, you need to do something. So this is when you move files into the propers. So there are other things that I'm not going to show you here. But if you get to the point where you have to bring together all your resources into that resource bundle, and you need to make sure that everything is there and nothing is missing, and there is something missing, like the relevant media files, which happens a lot, well, then there is nothing to be done, and you cannot delay it. You must go and find them. So, I think what I wanted to tell you is how, is how important it actually is to take the human factor into account when you plan and manage su such a distributed project. And um, also that, you know, it would be really nice if you had a better system, for instance, for managing metadata. You know, I was looking in awe at the CTEX program and other programs projects that have so much automated, uh, so many automated steps in their workflow. Clearly, we could do better uh, with that. Um, what I wasn't talking about is how we can integrate social linguistic data. That is something we really haven't looked at <coughs> in our project. So that's part of the individual research <coughs> project, and everybody manages their individual data, and we have not even attempted you know, to enrich our corpus with that. That would be an important next step uh, for us. And yeah, automation of certain processes and reliable online access. And maybe something um, that is under development in many uh, language documentation um, um, projects. If you can't have really online access, then try to have an app that helps you to uh, collect immediate metadata maybe even one that doesn't, you know, that automatically uh, uh, collects uh, GIS data so that you do not have to collect that uh, separately. But that's really the next step. So for now, I just thank you. <laughs> and stop here. So they'd apply even if you were in a pre-digital exactly. age, even if you'd have been recording yeah, these on, yeah, yeah. on tape yeah. and, and transcribing yeah. them yeah. on typewriters. Yeah. Still. Yeah. yeah, but I think 90% of problems in digital data management are not about the digital at all. There are loads of problems about the digital that I did not even touch upon. Um, because I hope somebody else will take care of them, like, you know, the uh, regular migration of our data formats, for instance, you know, I mean, this is, we have funding for five years, you know, <laughs> this is, nobody will look after that if the archive uh, that cannot find a good way of doing that, but, yeah. yeah I'll just add to this comment, mm -hmm. as P PI on the project we're on, th these sort of issues could have been looked at earlier than they were. And uh, I say that to John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, watch out. This is, I hope you are paying attention. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're saying that now. <laughs> now? Oh, I'm not saying you're paying attention. Not yet. <laughs> I'm saying but you will. will. <laughs> I'm saying you have, you know, the next three months or something. All indi indications are you will make those mistakes. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> no, I'm sure that you tinker with the workflow constantly. Constantly. Yeah. It really needs looking after, like a potted plant. Yeah. 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 But mm -hmm. it's, the first problem is yeah. knowing that you need one. Knowing that you need one and that you need to look after it. So you kind of need to acknowledge that that, that is important. And I, in my experience, this is my third language documentation project. And so we are not trained for that, we are not prepared for that, and there, there are no easy templates for this. Uh, so, you know, you, you really need somebody to take that on. 
Yeah, the way we look at it is the systems aren't the workflow. Yeah, no, no, the they aren't. Systems support the workflow. Yeah, exactly. So the workflow is the human factor. Yeah. And the human knowledge. So, and the systems are always lossy. They are. And they can be actually real obstacles. So, it's, and it's hard to build good systems that scale for good work. And the systems, the systems in, you know, in digital humanities are often very clunky <coughs> and very, very frightening, especially for humanities researchers who are not dedicated digital humanities people, you know. Um, so it takes a lot of hand-holding and determination to overcome that, in my experience as well. Okay, so we have to move on now.